welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on innovative methods and metrics for climate change, food systems, and health. Uh, today we're going to talk about how we overcome the data deficit. So my name is Claudia Offner, and I am presenting with my colleagues Megan Dini and Tony Carr. We are based in the Nutrition Group of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and all of us work within uh, the area of nutrition, climate change, food systems, etc. So the learning lab outcomes for this session are to explore different data sources and methods for research within the climate change food system and health nexus. And we're going to be critically assessing these different data sources and methods uh, to try and understand their strengths and limitations for generating evidence on, on complex exposure outcome pathways. And at the end of the session, we hope to generate some ideas with you all on how these data and methods can be applied for your own research and um, to generate new research questions. Uh, so just to quickly um, recap the links between climate change and agriculture, nutrition, and health, um, both of these are two extremely huge and enormously complicated problems. And I'm presenting some very simplified DAGs here today, um, just to kind of recap. Um, across the whole food system chain, from agroenvironmental to nutrition and health, um, we are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases. So I believe uh, food systems account for about 26% of all greenhouse gases emitted, um, which is quite a big chunk, actually. But these greenhouse gases, in turn, have effects on different parts of the, um, the food supply chain. So these, can, these are mostly bad. A few of them are good. But for example, you have um, greenhouse gases impacting acute respiratory um, infections for health. And that's also related to chronic diseases like cardiovascular health, um, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, in addition to this, uh, elevated CO2 levels do uh, improve crop conditions, but they simultaneously uh, improve conditions for pests and weeds. Um, so on the atmosphere and weather side, these greenhouse gases in turn impact how, it, how in, in, uh, the frequency of extreme weather events and uh, droughts and floods and things like that. And this impacts the whole food system supply chain, um, and it, it impacts it quite directly in short term, in the short term, but also in the long term. So altogether, it's quite a complex. Um, there's quite a few complex pathways to look at, and this is compounded by other anthropogenic drivers like population growth, pollution, energy consumption, land degradation, um, and things like that. Um, so that, those diagrams come from a piece of work that we've been doing with uh, the Amana program at LSHTM, where we've been looking at intersections of climate change, food systems, nutrition, and health. And this is the scoping review and evidence and gap map of 860 reviews within this area. Um, this uh, work is ongoing, but just to give you um, some numbers from our preliminary analysis, the majority of, our, of the synthesis that exists currently is predominantly focused on food pre-farm gate food production, uh, followed by agroenvironmental factors. There is less synthesis around nutrition and health and post-farm gate food systems, and there's been an overwhelming call to bolster climate change adaptation mitigation strategies for nutrition and health. Um, and this, uh, this is um, compounded by the fact that there's a lack of methods and metrics that are adequately capturing these complex systems. And so this is what we want to talk about today, um, these gaps in method, uh, methods and metrics within these complex areas. Um, the three of us work uh, in like with the data deficit in this area, and today we'll just talk about some data sources and methods that we use to overcome this. So I'll pass this on to my colleague, Tony. So, um... I will talk now about um, scenario an analysis using food system models, which is my main research focus, um, and how to get the data that you need for food system modeling. Um, so first, I will talk a bit about an introduction of food system models and talk about the different links uh, which exist in food systems, which give a good impression about how much data is needed in food system modeling. Um, so first of all, uh, food systems um, consist of different components, uh, which start from production to food waste. Um, and all these components are linked again to 
the environment and many aspects of our life, like culture, economy, education, and health, and, and many more. Um, so production, first of all, is linked to natural resources, um, like land, soil, water, um, but also to machines and energy um, that we need to use for agriculture. Um, then pro the processing component is also included in food systems, uh, which includes the packaging process or the process of transforming food products into other products like strawberries to chain, for example. Distribution like retail, wholesale and consumers are also included. This is all of us or um, also schools and hospitals where we eat food, restaurants, supermarkets and so on. And the last component is food waste, which includes compost um, and the energy we need um, to process food waste. Um, and other links. Um, so uh, food systems um, have a lot of different impacts on the environment because of the many links. Um, first of all, it contributes to climate change with greenhouse gas emissions. Um, agriculture especially has a big demand for water. So most freshwater withdrawals are, are used for agriculture. So that's a big impact. And of course, there's also a big demand for land due to agriculture, which has lots of different effects on also greenhouse gas emissions again. Uh, but another important effect is on biodiversity um, affected by land use. And the challenge in, in food systems is basically that we need to address and consider these impacts um, but we also need to maintain a nutritious food supply for us. Um, this is a further example of the environmental impacts of food systems. This is the breakdown of global greenhouse gas emissions from food production. And in the graph, you can see um, basically that the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions globally comes from livestock and fisheries production. Um, but also a large share is from crop production, from which, of course, um, a lot of it is produced due to for livestock. Um, and then a large share is also through land use change. So this is the, um, for example, the change of forest to cropland or pasture, which emits a lot of greenhouse gases. So as you can see uh, um, from these different components is that we we influence these emissions through what we eat, how we use land, and how we handle food waste. And so these whole all the relationships they also go um, in the opposite direction. So there are many impacts of the environment on food systems, and the uh, yeah, most famous one is the impact of climate change on agriculture, which. Uh, impacts agriculture through droughts, through flooding, shifts in uh, growing season, growing areas, uh, pest diseases, and also the health of livestock is affected by climate change. Then biodiversity also affects food systems the other way around, mainly again through uh, production, um, because biodiversity is important for the pollination of plants, for pest control, um, and also it has an important role in the fertility of soil, which of course influences the growth of crops. Um, then water quality, like polluted water, also affects our food system, uh, mainly of production again. Um, land degradation, which we influence a lot through um, land use and transformation of land, has a huge impact on, on agriculture and crop production through soil erosion, through the loss of the fertility of soil, um, salinization, and many other forms of, of land degradation are included. Um, and then sea level rise and ocean acidification also affects food systems through flooding and salinization again, um, and it affects fish stocks, of course. Um, so as you can see, a lot of these environmental impacts mainly affect the food system via food production. Um, and that leads to a lot of 
different food system challenges, mainly around food availability or disruption of supply chains. Um, and via these pathways, the food system also has an effect on our health. Uh, so generally, there are many links between food systems and health by um, providing food and nutrition security. And the most direct link is via the food quantity and the food quality in our diets, um, which of course affects the nutrient and energy intake um, or it affects the um, NCDs, diseases that, that we um, might get from our diets. Um, and so climate change also indirectly affects our health via the food system because it has an impact on the availability of our food. Okay, so in, in summary, there was a quick summary of the many links that exist between the environment, food systems and health. Um, there are many different components, many links, many relationships, which go in every direction. Um, yeah, all these components influence each other. So in summary, it's a really complex system. It's very complicated. And that's that's where we need food system models because they are a great tool to, to analyze and understand the system. Um, and yeah, so with food system models, we can understand the system behavior and we can identify leverage points on how we can modify certain components of the system, uh, which can become really important in informing policy makers or other decision makers and coming up with strategies to improve the food system. Um, there are many, many different food system models which exist. Um, they vary a lot in how complex they are, how easy to use they are, and also they some of them focus on uh, certain components more than others. Um, one that I used a lot in my work is the Fable model, um, which is a very comparatively simple food system model. It's freely available online. Um, and it's based on Excel. So it's quite easy to use in comparison to other food system models. Um, it is a uh, Clobium, it's another um, widely used food system models, but this one is a really complex one. Um, and Fable is, so to say, a simplified version of Clobium. Um, and then Magpie would be another commonly used food system models. And yeah, there are many, many more. There are also online tools which you can use um, to look into outputs of food system models and analyze different indicators from food systems. There's the food system dashboard from the FAO, the food sustainability index from um, the Economist um, Publishing House, or the food systems mapping and anal analysis toolkit. Um, and again, there, there are many more you can find online, which can be quite useful if you want to have if you look for, um, quickly look for some indicators uh, of food systems for certain countries. So because um, food systems are so complex and are linked with many areas, they also have a high um, demand for data. Um, so these are some examples of common types of data that are required for inputs um, into the models. So of course we we have um, we need the model needs to know about production data like agricultural production crop yields or livestock production um, then consumption data is a diff, um, an important input so those are food consumption patterns dietary preferences basically how much um, demand for certain food groups exists um, and the model typically needs also to simulate trade and supply chains, um, mainly the import and export of different food products. Um, environmental data 
is often needed, like climate data, soil data, water availability, which mainly affects um, how the model um, simulates production of food. Um, in some models, we need economic data. Some analy analysts are interested in prices, market trends, and the yeah, other financial indicators. Um, policies um, are quite useful to to create scenarios for future directions of the food systems. Uh, for this also demographic, socioeconomic data is quite important, especially population demographics, because they um, influence a lot the uh, potential food demand in the future, um, which can be yeah, simulated with different scenarios. Um, and then health and nutrition indicators are also often used in, in food system models. So the data, typically you, you don't need to have detailed data of every component. Um, the data needs to depend a lot on the purpose of the food system, um, on the type of research that you're using the food system model for. And then also, of course, about the scale you're using the model, do you use it for a certain like, small region or do you want to use it for a whole continent? Uh, of course, it also influences your data needs. Um, and depending on these needs, the quality of the data can be also very variable. So those are important considerations. And this is a simplified overview on how to get this data. There are many different ways to um, get data, which you can use for inputs. Um, often, especially at the beginning, publicly available databases are used from the FAO, like the um, uh, food balance sheets, which have national information on food supply and production, import, consumption of different food products. Um, and then there are many other publicly available databases that are often quite useful from similar institutions like USDA, World Bank, OECD, um, and so on. You can also use GIS data, Google Earth Engine is used a lot. Claudia will talk a bit more about this. Um, and if you need more detailed data or certain kind of data that is maybe lacking in publicly available data bases and field studies um, are useful to, to primarily um, collect the data uh, through surveys. That's often done. So the household surveys are often useful um, to get data for food system models um, or farm level data collection if you need specific information about um, farming techniques. Um, and stakeholder um, engagement is also useful to get data for food system models. Um, you can organize workshops to get opinions of ex experts or you can interview experts. Um, and then often stakeholders have data that you didn't know of or which is not publicly available. Um, and then you can also collect data through systematic review of case studies and then basically go through a bunch of papers and extract data from there that you need for your model. So there are many options and all these options, they have a lot of different benefits and disadvantages, and some of which uh, we can discuss later in the breakout room breakout room on, on food systems. Um, just a quick introduction to a case study, um, which um, I will talk more about in the breakout room. So this is a recent project in the Gambia where we used the food system model FABER. Um, that was part of the Face Africa project at LSHTM, which is about adapting food systems to climate change and increasing food demand in different regions in Africa. Um, and here we use the, the FABLE model to simulate the current food system in the Gambia, and we made projections about future food demand and, and supply. And then we also analyzed the impact of different strategies to, to boost domestic agriculture uh, in the future. Um, so for, for this project, we, we focused on food and nutrition security in the future. And for this, we required data on population diets, production, land use, and trade. And we had different strategies to get this data. 
Um, and this is a, yeah, a simple first results, which shows some of the data that we were looking into. So this shows the historic food demand and uh, food import and food production. And then based on these scenarios, um, we made some projections into the future, how demand grows and production and import, and then um, if it is feasible to reach this or not. Great, thanks, Tony. Um, so I'll I'll now present to you guys on um, how to, how to link remote response to climatic exposures to health outcomes. So before we delve into that, um, first want to take a moment to define uh, what is remote sensing. So remote sensing is the process of detecting and monitoring the physical characteristics of an area by measuring its reflected and emitted radiation at a distance. So typically from a satellite or aircraft, but today we'll be speaking um, exclusively about satellites. Uh, so just going to give you guys a little bit of um, background on, and it, it's kind of, it might, some of it's a bit uh, high school physics, but I, it won't be a massive part of the paper, and don't worry, but it is helpful to know in, when understanding remotely sensed data. So uh, there's two types. First, we have passive sensing, which involves uh, uh, measuring uh, radiation wavelengths from the sun that's bouncing back up to the satellite from Earth. And then you have active sensing, which is when the satellite or aircraft will emit um, a radiation wavelength to the Earth and measure the information that comes back. And so some examples of this, um, one being Google uh, Google Maps. So this is an example of multispectral satellite imaging. And here you can see what we um, as humans can see with the visible eye. So this is the red, blue, and green bands, which I'll explain with this in a bit. But um, yes, this is one example of satellite imagery that we're all familiar with. Uh, another example would be um, aircraft travel. So uh, radar satellite, uh, radar imaging from aircrafts. Aircrafts will emit radar um, wavelengths to detect what is in its vicinity, and it doesn't necessarily need to use um, any multi, uh, any spectral wavelength for that. Um, and so these are just some examples of what these data, data sources might look like. Some of them are quite intuitive, like the red, blue, green uh, type multispectral image, but others, you might not necessarily know what you're looking at, um, and it requires a bit more background knowledge. Um, and so just quickly here, you guys might recognize uh, this uh, electromagnetic spectrum from high school. Don't worry, don't need to know this in depth for a uh, breakout room, but I just want to explain that um, satellites collect information in bands. And bands are essentially different overlays or different layers of information um, that are collected by a certain uh, satellite or sentinel. And so um, some popular bands that multispectral satellites would collect would be um, red, blue, and green. And these are part of the visible light spectrum. So this is what we uh, can see with our own naked eye. But other satellites are able to collect um, ultraviolet rays, infrared rays, uh, radar, gamma rays or X-rays um, to essentially different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to um, create different measures and metrics uh, for phenomena that's being observed on the ground on Earth. And so satellite sensing has a variety of different benefits. So on the one hand, you have the, the benefits of uh, spatial resolution. Um, so satellites, are able to collect data anywhere on the globe, and you have like a full global coverage, which allows you to investigate different phenomena at both national, um, site-specific, or regional uh, levels, depending on your uh, computer's processing speed. But then on the other hand, we have uh, this data at very high frequency. So some, depending on the satellite, some can collect uh, data every week, every day, maybe every hour, if you have a very fast satellite. Um, but Essentially, you have very high uh, frequency data, which is amazing and perfect for uh, real time monitoring, especially uh, for the environmental sciences. This is very important in climate change as well to be able to change, uh, to be able to detect changes over time. Um, and so, with satellite sensing, we can get a variety of different measures and metrics, um, and you can get these measures by 
mining different bands using various different um, algorithms and formulae. So you can get temperature, rainfall, soil moisture, water extents, uh, level of vegetation, land use, and a variety of others. It's it's not this is not an exhaustive list. There's quite a lot of different measures we can collect satellite data. Um, but I just want to highlight here that while we have these measures that we can uh, create by combining different bands, uh, we can also take various indices and combine those to make other indices. So for instance, drought indexes like uh, TI, SPEI um, are combinations of precipitation and evaporation transpiration indexes. And I'll just walk you through an example of how um, one metric is calculated, the normalized difference vegetation index. And so here we can see um, the normal red, green, blue bands together. This is a picture of soybean and maize production in West Kansas. And you see it kind of looks dry to our naked eye. But how, how can we actually like capture and quantify this dryness with satellite data? Is like, is there a way to do this? Um, so that's what NDVI does. Uh, it takes a combination of the red from the visible spectrum and the near infrared from another part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and you apply a formula uh, such that near infrared minus red over near infrared plus red, um, and you'll get a measure of how green or how healthy the vegetation is on the ground. And this is what it looks like when you do this um, co composite calculation. And so here, uh, green indicates higher, um, high levels of healthy vegetation. Yellow indicates low or maybe unhealthy levels of vegetation. And red indicates no vegetation. And so you can kind of see here towards the right of the screen, um, like a huge spot of red. And that's because there was a cloud there, um, which like that's another that's an example of, of a potential pitfall of satellite data but we can um, talk about that in the breakout rooms. So satellite uh, sensing and its ANH applications. So a lot of satellite data is currently being used to monitor agriculture and it's quite uh, it's quite effectively been um, taken up in this area. So it doesn't just monitor vegetation health, like we said in this previous slide. It also must use it to monitor topography, soil compactions, nitrogen stress, crop density, yields, quality, um, and, and similar and other things. And it's uh, even more useful when you can compare this with automated tools from like AI machine which can help us detect fruit or bees, uh, diseases, and biomass. Um, more recently, there's uh, emerging research that, link, but this is still um, this is still underway. And you know, when we when we see this, uh, it seems that we already use this tool quite a bit, right? Uh, well, one of the things that we found in this review that I mentioned earlier, um, when we examined mechanisms of change, we were examining parts of uh, we didn't necessarily look at remote sensing specifically, but we have been looking at related um, related phenomena like uh, technology information, research models, research metrics. And as we were analyzing these different papers, we noticed that there actually wasn't a huge amount of papers representing remote sensing or uh, geographic information systems. Um, and in fact, only 20 papers out of the at the, out of the 860 that's a type of, uh, studies, um, ended up mentioning remote sensing. And so even though, it, it, and bear in mind, these are synthesis papers, these aren't primary research, but um, there does seem to be less focus on remote sensing data or uh, satellite data. And it kind of brings us to question, like, why, why is this happening? And so when we look at the two disciplines between climate change, nutrition, and health, we see that there is actually quite a big difference in the data types that are being used in these disciplines. So on the one hand, climate change and environmental sciences uses a lot of satellite data, weather station um, data, sensors, gauges, things like this. And these uh, data sources tend to be collected in very high spatial resolution and um, at multiple intervals. And these tend to be publicly accessible. On the flip side, in um, nutrition and health, we predominantly use surveys, which are absolutely excellent at getting um, human experiential data and human experience of uh, various phenomena like um, food security, um, optometry, um, variety of different things that you absolutely can't gauge with a satellite. 
Um, but when we try to link these two different data, it's a bit of a challenge because surveys tend to be collected um, uh, like at baseline and endline. So we'll have it maybe annually at best, but we're not actually capturing a huge amount of fluctuations during the year, which makes it rather difficult to pair with um, naturally like cyclical phenomena like, um, like flooding or droughts, which tend to span seasons. Um, and then on the other side, on the flip side, we also have um, that there isn't as much spatial information that comes with this due to the sensitivity around um, just like disposing where people live. And even if there is spatially explicit data from surveys, it's not always public and um, it's just quite challenging to find spatially explicit and high frequency health data. Um, yeah, so how, how do we bridge this? Um, how can we bridge this in the long term? So as a sector, um, of course, everyone suggests getting better data um, <laughs> and at, at higher spatial temporal resolutions. This is a bit wishful, but I mean, it's still something, it's still a big um, component on many research agendas. But then as a discipline, we can be looking more into interdisciplinary collaboration, which has been cropping up more and more on various different research agendas. And it's very important that we continue to do this, so that we can harness the full potential of technological advances and global health research. But then as individuals, we also need to be looking at scaling up so we can better understand the data nuances between disciplines and sectors, so that we can innovate new methods and metrics to better inform decisions around the climate change and NH nexus. Thanks, Claudia. And really warm welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining our session today. And what I'll be talking about is sort of um, the similar concept of this nexus of food systems, climate change um, and health research. But what we'll be looking at um, with life cycle assessment is sort of a different direction from, from what we've discussed in the other two, which is sort of climate change impacts on food systems and then subsequently the impacts on nutrition and health. And so what we're going to look at now is sort of uh, the food system's impact on climate change and then subsequent impacts on health. So just a slightly different angle to this type of research. And I'm just going to kick it off with a brief video, which um, hopefully you'll be able to hear. It sums it up quite succinctly. Take a look around you. The air that you breathe, the water, and the light. There is a whole system of interactions that make life possible. Look around you. Behind everything, there's a story. It's life cycle. We extract raw materials. We transport and transform them into products which become waste after being used. These processes involve machines and human beings using energy and generating more waste and emissions. Our way of producing and consuming is putting the system we belong to at risk. The most evident manifestation is climate change. We need a change. And to drive the change, global and interconnected goals to transform our world have been set by United Nations. But to make the change, we need a new way of thinking. We have to concentrate on the chain of environmental, economic, and social implications of our decisions. That is what we call life cycle thinking, taking into account environmental, economic, and social impacts of our products and processes at each stage of their life cycle, and how decisions taken at one stage might impact consequences at another stage. We are all decision makers, and we all have a role to play. Base your decisions on life cycle thinking. Where and how life cycle thinking helps when making decisions. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little overview of what life cycle assessment is and this kind of the, the concept behind it is taking this life cycle approach and then life cycle assessment is the methodology that we'll be discussing and, and using today, hopefully. 
So in its essence, it's really an environmental impact assessment method, but it's developed um, over time to include all of these different indicators, some of which are really relevant for global health research. Um, but the concept, as, as we've seen, is to look at a product, process or service and then to account for its entire life cycle, starting from its production through to its use and transport and different waste disposal um, and waste management scenarios. And it's really its main use and its kind of real strong point is to identify um, life cycle hotspots for determining where we're having the greatest impacts and therefore which areas we can hope to change. Um, and also to compare different scenarios. So, for example, you might want to compare one product versus another to see which is more kind of environmentally friendly, um, for example, in terms of climate change. Um, and then we can, of course, explore different uh, trade offs and co benefits across indicators as well. So that's one of the real kind of strengths of life cycle assessment in this context. And just to give you a little bit of background on kind of its development, um, this is really relevant for food systems because actually life cycle assessment sort of began in its origin with food systems, unfortunately, um, uh, sort of with uh, an unpublished study by Coca-Cola looking at different packaging formats. Um, and that was around 1969. And since then, it's developed mainly actually through industry, which has caused some kind of reputational issues. Um, but in the last couple of decades, it's taken on a real uh, kind of standardized approach. And this is really being driven forwards by the Life Cycle Initiative um, and, and CTEC, um, which are international organizations which are really leading the way on standardizing and making these methods much more transparent and much more easy to use um, in, a, in the research context. There's a lot of developments happening right now, which are really exciting in terms of food systems. Um, and, and these are kind of taking various different forms, for example, um, ways to account for microplastics um, coming out of food systems, um, and also where, ways to pair life cycle assessment with nutritional assessment so that we get a really kind of broad idea of what food systems are doing to our health, both in terms of the direct nutritional consequences, but also in terms of the environmental health impacts. So it's a really exciting methodology. And for um, those of you that haven't used it yet, um, hopefully I'll give a, a bit of an overview of some of these strengths. As you can see, these are just a couple of examples that I picked up. It's been applied in so many different ways throughout the food system already um, and different elements of um, agriculture, for example, and specific food products and then system levels and to different policies as well and to even uh, kind of extending to different future scenarios so it's a very, very diverse tool that can be used in many different ways I'm just going to walk us through very quickly a kind of broad overview of how you actually conduct a life cycle assessment and this is going to feed into our breakout work later um, so there are four key steps and these are really iterative in process so um, you can revisit some of these steps once you get further down the line and you see what's happening in terms of the data as you go along. But beginning firstly with the goal and scope uh, definition. So we start, as I mentioned, with a product, process or service, um, and then we try to define its, its quantity and quality so that we know exactly what we're dealing with. And this is known as your functional unit. And basically everything that you do subsequently in a life cycle assessment hangs around this functional unit. So, for example, one apple that weighs 100 grams. We then build a picture of its life cycle, so how it's produced, the way that it's transported, where it's sold, how it's used or cooked, um, and then its waste disposal scenarios as well. We also have to consider what ge geographical scope is this taking place in? Is this a uh, supply chain across a kind of international scope? Is this within a local region, for example? Um, and so it could be within one geographical scope or different stages might apply to different geographies as well. And then, of course, we consider that it's not just this one life cycle, it also has intersecting factors with different inputs at different stages and different waste disposal um, uh, management scenarios at different stages as well. And so you can see, I hope that this kind of simple chain of the, uh, the life cycle can become quite complex quite quickly. Um, but in principle, it's all dealt with in the same kind of way. So each stage, what are its inputs and what are its emissions um, for each of those life cycle stages? The second stage then 
is this inventory analysis. And essentially for each of those life cycle stages that you've determined, you want to end up with a list of all of the resources used and all of the emissions generated for each uh, process or life cycle stage. And there's a lot of different uh, ways that we can put this information together. So you might, for example, use primary data, which would involve something like in your um, farm or in your orchard, actually measuring the inputs that you're um, using to produce your apple and then measuring the emissions that are being caused as well. Um, clearly, that has uh, you know, implications in terms of time and cost and the geographical scope that you can hope to um, apply to that. And so there are um, several data kind of secondary data repositories that you can look at as well. And these are really rapidly evolving at the moment. One of the ones that I've been working with is um, EcoInvent, which is a fantastic resource. It's got, I think, around 18,000 different data sets for various industrial processes um, that apply to different sectors, um, including agriculture. Um, however, it is very focused on the Swiss context. There are global data sets, but um, by and large, they've been extrapolated from others. Um, and I've just put a few examples of other similar lifecycle inventory specific uh, secondary data sources here. Um, for example, the AgriBallets one is um, specific to the French context. We've got one that's European focused and one that's also um, world focused. And these are all um, agri-food specific data sources. Um, so fantastic resources, but with their own limitations in terms of the geographies that they cover, in terms of um, the kind of biases that are in, inherent in that. Um, and of course, it's not necessarily a bad thing to extrapolate this information um, from primary primary data in one source to to a kind of another geography. Um, it's what we might do in epidemiology as well, from one population to another. But it does, of course, have its limitations um, inherently in that. And the third option, if none of those, uh, none of the first two primary data or secondary data are available, we can and, and people do frequently use expert opinion and transparent assumptions um, to fill in those data gaps in terms of conducting your life cycle assessment. The third step then is your impact assessment. And basically, this is just converting your full list of inventory resources used and emissions generated into categories of impact. And of course, the one that we're really considering today is climate change. So you might be taking, for example, from your inventory, your carbon dioxide emissions, your methane emissions, and converting those to their subsequent impact on climate change. And then those are known as midpoint impacts. What you could then do is convert those to their subsequent impact on human health impacts, for example. And luckily, these methods, these conversions, these steps that we're taking um, are laid out for us in life cycle assessment methodology. And there's a few different ones that we can choose from and we can discuss those um, in a bit more detail later on. And finally, your interpretation. So this is bringing everything that you see together. It will split out some numbers at the end, which will tell you your impacts of your product process or service on climate change on global health in terms of disability adjusted life years. And this is really about taking all of that information and trying to put it in context. And there's various different ways that we can do that um, and approach it. We might be asking different questions. So which product is more sustainable than another? What proportion of climate change impacts is this product responsible for? Um, and so we just need to make sure that when we're interpreting this data, we're doing it in the context of the questions that we asked and how we designed our life cycle assessment. So that's a very rapid fire overview of what life cycle assessment is and um, what you can do with it. And I just wanted to show you briefly a case study um, that we've been working on in Amana, which is uh, applying life cycle assessment to food system plastics. And so we might ask why food system plastics? Well, we all know um, that we've absolutely created a, a monster out of single use plastics. The pollution is absolutely staggering. And we do think that actually the food system might be the biggest driver of this. So 40% um, of all plastic produced is packaging. And a huge portion of that is due to the food system where of course we um, are using enormous amounts of single use pl plastic packaging for various applications. And this doesn't even take into account um, agricultural plastics, which are used extensively of course in greenhouses and in uh, agricultural mulch laid on the ground. And of course, in the fishing industry as well. So there's so many sources of plastics um, from the food system that are causing this huge amount of pollution as well. 
And this year alone, um, our projections are, uh, are thinking that we'll produce 390 million metric tons of pl plastic waste on a global scale. Um, and 40% of this will end in kind of mismanaged scenarios, including open burning, which of course has really serious impacts on global health. Currently, many of you may already know that there is um, a global plastics treaty underway that's being negotiated over the next two years um, to end plastic pollution. And there being uh, within these documents um, for the global plastics treaty, a life cycle approach is really being called out incredibly strongly. It keeps being repeated. Um, it's really feeding into the discussions about what, what strategies are we actually taking to tackle plastic pollution. And so this is where this um, methodology can really support these kind of policy level decision making uh, issues as well. And so just briefly, what are the human health impacts of the global plastics life cycle and plastic waste reduction scenarios? Well, we know that uh, plastic is having impacts on human health throughout its life cycle from raw material extraction, which causes um, greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutants um, through to use. Of course, we've heard a lot about microplastics and chemicals leaching into food and drink and also disposal. And as I just mentioned, open burning being one of those, again, is really driving um, huge amounts of greenhouse gas emissions and subsequent climate change impacts and therefore impacts on global health as well. And so the analysis that we've done has used life cycle assessment specifically um, in combination with another model to estimate what happens to global health under various waste reduction strategy policy scenarios um, for plastic pollution from uh, 2016 actually um, until 2040. And what we've been able to, uh, to say using this methodology is that even the best case scenario for reducing plastic pollution doesn't go far enough to protect human health. And one of the main drivers of these uh, global health impacts is this climate change pathway um, and those are kind of within the bars on the on the bottom scale that's the the red impacts and the yellow ones are actually air pollutants um, but this kind of nexus is really really critical for linking plastics through to climate change through to global health impacts so that's one way that we've applied life cycle assessment methodology and that it's been um, really informative for and just to leave you with some thoughts before I briefly um, talk about the breakout room, um, we've got a real great diversity and from the chat box I can see it, um, how many different geographies um, people are coming from today. Um, we really need more data, as Claudia was saying, it's off in the way, um, but we need more data on food systems um, and with a greater geographical coverage. A lot of these lifecycle inventory repositories, as I mentioned, um, are full of European data and we really need um, much greater coverage in terms of um, conducting these global assessments. Um, and life cycle assessment has also been applied kind of for the needs um, of many kind of European and North American um, questions. And so we really want to start applying those um, in a way that's more useful in terms of the LMIC context. Um, thank you all. It's been such a pleasure and it's really great seeing all of your um, positive feedback and comments in the, in the chat. Really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you. Um, over to you, Elena. Let's give a big round of applause to our facilitators. Thank you, Megan, Claudia, and Tony for this session. Um, I'd encourage you all to go to the ANH website to see the program for the rest of the conference. We have two more learning labs today starting in 30 minutes. Uh, you can access the Zoom links to those on the conference website. So thanks so much. I look forward to seeing more of you all in the coming days.